fear. Maybe it's a chain of doubt. Uh, maybe it's a chain of bitterness where God needs to help you forgive. Uh, let's just take about 30 seconds right now before we do the next thing, move on to the next thing. Would you just take a minute between you and God and just come before him and pray? And say, God, I, I need you to help me break that chain, whatever that chain might be in your life. Let's do that together. Father, I just pray for uh, whatever chains are a part of this room, God, whatever chains we carry, whether it's a chain of fear, uh, of doubt, of bitterness, uh, of an addiction, and the ability to forgive. God, would you provide us healthy people and spaces where we can process? God, we pray for supernatural breakings of chains, but we recognize at the same time You work through community, you work through your word, you work through spiritual practices and a process. So God, I pray, whatever your method is, that you would give us the courage to take the step that we need to, to see freedom from those things. Give us the courage. Give us the community. Grateful that you never leave us. I pray this in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Go ahead and take a seat. Awesome. Hey, at this time, I'm just going to invite uh, one of our friends up here. You give her a hand. This is Joni. Thanks. And uh, we just asked uh, Joni briefly, as we kind of celebrate our two-year today, uh, to share just a few things about her participation and her presence here with our community. But before we do that, uh, for those maybe of of you guys who don't know who Joni is, her family, would you just take a minute to introduce yourself? Yeah, and your sure. family, your kids. Hi, church. Um, I feel bad. They're like back there. Uh, my name's Joni. I'm part of the Valdez family. Um, you've probably seen T uh, moving stuff around, and no doubt you have heard all three of my children <laughs> screaming and or running through this sanctuary. Lisa is six, Ezra is four, and Aaron is just about to turn two. There you go. Right. It's a coincidence. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Well, thanks in the midst of uh, having those three young kids and a life saying yes to this. We appreciate you doing that. Um, what has 168 meant to you and your family? Um, I think for me, when I first was told about this church being planted in the middle of coronavirus, <laughs> I had very high uh, yeah, there was, there was a little bit of a lag time as to how that might play out. Um, it was also when pretty much I had just found out I was pregnant with Aaron. So, like, the timing of it was very, like, overwhelming in and of its sense. And then to see it grow from literally, like, a baby to where it is now, like John said earlier, as a toddler, um, you know, this place for our family has really meant... It's the first community where us as a family of five have been known together. And it's, so it's, it's a very special place for us. This is where we dedicated our kids. This is where we come every Sunday, whether it's a good Sunday or a bad Sunday, mm-hmm. and where our kids always leave feeling loved and thankful. And so for us, it's, it's, it's an integral part of our, our rhythms as a family. Yeah. I mean, Carl and I thought that uh, planting in COVID was the best idea, so we just kept going forward with that. Uh, w- one part of 168 Mission is to participate in the flourishing, in the flourishing of our community In what way has that value impacted you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, becoming a mother, which is relatively due to me, uh, it was always about me being a part of a church, right? Me doing, what can I do? Can I be a part of the worship team? Can I welcome people? Can I do the mixer board? Or can I clean up? Or, you know, and it was always about me doing ministry or the Lord doing ministry through me by myself. But here... I really am so thankful that God gave me a place to participate in doing ministry as a family and as a community. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't feel like my presence here makes a difference ministry-wise in terms of I'm not 
playing the piano like Andrew every week, or, you know, I'm not outside, you know, like Gabe greeting people, but that presence of ministry, of just showing up, um, God has shown me that that's how we can participate in community here at church. And, you know, my kids are pretty fun, I'd like to think. So I think they, they let people, you know, you know, feel loved as well. And so for me, it's a special place because it's a shift from ministry being an individual calling to what does that look like in a community as family. So mm. yeah. your presence makes a difference. Oh, you too, week. Pastor John. Thank you. That was scripted. You Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the last question that I had was, what is one prayer that you have for our faith community? But um, right before I said, hey, instead of you just sharing or talking about that, I would love for you to just pray for us, just to pray whatever the Lord has laid on your heart for us in this community. Let's do that together. Okay, let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are exactly that, that you are the father of this two-year-old toddler church. Yeah. And just as a toddler looks to its parents, for everything, we as a church, as a community, we continue to look for you to every, for everything, right. and you continue to provide what we need and much more. Um, we thank you for this newborn stage of our church and this toddler stage of our church that you are laying foundations um, for what is to come as we grow. We thank you that as we continue as a community to pursue Christ, to um, participate in community, and to proclaim that to the world around us, Lord, that we will always have the heart of a toddler, that it is you doing the work. That's right. And that it's you who will get the glory for it all, too. We thank you so much for this community. We know, God, that you have met so many people in this room or online that you have more <laughs> than we could have ever expected moved um, in so much in these past two years, whether it's um, in individual families, through our connections with community, um, through our missions even around the world, Lord, we thank you that we have been able to be a part just by participating here at 168. Um, we do want to lift up Pastor John and Pastor Carl and their families, Lord. We thank you for their faith to step out, and their faith to say, God, why not us? Of course, you'll use us. We pray that you'll continue to bless that that you will protect their families, provide for them individually as families for everything that they need, God. And they know that as they serve the house of the Lord, that your, your special blessing will be upon them and their families as well. And we thank you so much that we get to celebrate just like you would with a two-year-old with cake and um, spending time together. And we thank you for every person that's here in person and online. And we thank you that you see us all and that you go with us and that you go before us. And that is our prayer for this church, that we will always walk in step with you, just as a toddler holds its dad's hand to learn how to walk. May we walk with you always. And then may we just simply proclaim that joy to the people around us. We thank you so much for this family. Thank you for the blessings that are to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we just give her a round of applause? Thank you, Joni. Well, thank you, Joni. I loved that they talked. She talked about community and like serving uh, as a family community. I love the word community. So when I talk to people and I, I tell them what I do for a living, and they say, "What's your church called?" I'm always very emphatic about one six eight community church. And I'm like, "We are a community." And I'm like, "Nothing happens in this room, in these services, in this community without you. Every single person uh, in this room, I can look at all of you and just name things that you all have done." Uh, for our community. So I'm going to sit here and look at all of you and say thank you because we wouldn't be having a second birthday without all of you. Just like it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a community to be, it takes people, it takes a lot of people to be a community. Uh, and that's what we are. So happy birthday, 168. Welcome to the service. Uh, I got a couple of quick announcements for you. And guess what? They're all about community. Yay. The first one is next Sunday. We will not actually be here uh, in the building. We'll actually be having church homes. So we believe in one church and many expressions. So next Sunday, 319, 2023 at 10 a.m., we'll be having church in two different locations. Um, be on the lookout in your email for the details, for the addresses for those. If you've never been to a church home or you want to invite somebody for the first time, listen, I'll guarantee this, there will be free breakfast. 
I put in the order already. It'll be pancakes. There'll be bacon. There'll be eggs. There'll be maple syrup. There'll be some orange juice. It'll be a great time. You'll have free breakfast. Uh, and then we'll have some time just together just to talk with one another, just to grow in community with one another. This is one of the easiest things to invite somebody to. If you've got a friend or somebody in your neighborhood or somebody that's just been questioning uh, just community or church or just being with people who uh, love the Lord, like this is such an easy opportunity to bring them to because we just sit there and we talk and we have a good time. If it's not snowing, I'm hoping one of those houses has a bonfire. We'll find out. But next Sunday, church home, 10 a.m. You don't want to miss it. I've been challenging you for the last three weeks, and I'm going to continue to challenge you. Who are you bringing with you? Who are you bringing with you? Take some time this week just to pray about who the Lord is asking you to bring with you. Hey, with community, we love doing things with other communities. If you were with us last year, we actually did Good Friday uh, with three other churches in the area meeting at another church's location while they met with their larger community. And we'll actually be doing that again. So Friday, April 7th, we'll be having a Good Friday service with two other church communities together. It's so cool just to worship, to worship with one another uh, and be together as a big C church for Good Friday. We'll have more details about what that will look like, where that's at um, as we continue to plan them. We've had a couple of calls and I'm super excited uh, to be with these two churches again uh, and just gathering to do Good Friday uh, t together. And then right after that, on Sunday, we have Easter Sunday. We will actually be meeting in the same location that we met in last year. Uh, it's called Bobak Signature Room. It's actually down the street off of 53. Uh, it's right behind the movie theater. If you've never been there, it's awesome. We'll have a morning service that day. So mark your calendars for Good Friday and Easter morning. I'm so excited for that. Now, the last thing is, hey, we've talked about community, we've talked about participating, we've, we've talked about just all these things, and I just want to tell you guys, I'm, like, today was a student Sunday, and let me tell you about community and people stepping up. I stepped up to serve in the worship team this morning, which I love doing, and without a blink of an eye, the student leaders stepped in, taught the lesson, took care of the kids, and even took them down to Dunkin' Donuts for some hot chocolate. They are amazing. They've stepped up in huge ways. And we're only able to do those things because of your generosity and your giving. We're only celebrating our second birthday because of your generosity and because of your giving. And not just of your financial resources, but of your time, of your talents, of your gifts. And we, we so appreciate that. So there are three ways that you can give uh, online or behind me. They're on the screen behind me. Online, here in person, or mail a check uh, to the address on the screen. Hey, I want to invite you to stay stick around after service. If you can see See that back wall over there? There's a nice cake. Uh, there's oranges, juice boxes, waters, Cheez-Its. There's also a gluten-free dessert for those who are gluten-free. So don't worry about that. If you're like, oh, cake, I'm leaving. I have a gluten-free dessert for you guys. We want to want, want to encourage you to stick around for that as we celebrate with one another and just talk about uh, where the church is going and just look back at where the church has been. But as Pastor John comes up, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to pray one more time just for our service and for our community. Uh, Heavenly Father, God, we come to you, Lord. Uh, we're so honored, God, that uh, you are with us. God, we're so honored that you um, have called us into community, God. We're so honored that we are celebrating our second birthday today, God, just because of your faithfulness, your grace, and your mercy. Uh, Lord, we continue to pray for your faithfulness and your grace and your mercy on us, God. We pray that we would just continue to yield to all that you're asking us to do and continue to be bold in the ways that you're asking us to be bold. And Lord, as you bring Pastor John up for the word this morning, God, I pray that you would just allow us to put all those things, our, our fears, our anxieties, our thoughts, and all those at the foot of your cross right now and just pay attention to the word that you have for us uh, through John. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, one more time. Happy birthday. Happy second birthday. Um, I caught some of the kids earlier looking at the balloons and they're arguing with each other saying, hey, I can't believe that our church is 20 years old because the two and the zero together, I think. The other one said, no, our church is 25 years old. And then I looked at them and I said, our church is two years old. And they both looked at me and they went, huh? Two? We're older? That's right, you are older. But hey, here's a first picture of uh, just a cute little picture. These are my kids. Not saying happy second birthday because it's impossible to coordinate that in that way. But um, just some context. This is a recycled and reused picture. I'm sorry. I just have to be honest. It's actually a picture that we took for my dad who's in, who's in South Korea. And we said, hey, why don't we just recycle and reuse because it's cool right now. But happy second birthday. But uh, here's one of my favorite pictures from early on in the life of the church. All right. It's my favorite picture for two reasons. Number one, because everybody else is working hard and I'm taking a selfie, all right? But the second reason is if you look 
real close, you see Caleb just intuitively staring at me with his eyes because he knows what's going on. He's like, what is he doing over there taking a selfie? If you look real close, he's giving me the side eye. But uh, hey, it's been, it's been just a two-year journey. Um, and I, I, was, I was telling the team earlier as we're praying, just like a toddler, you know, sometimes you have your highs, sometimes you have your lows, you have your moments of frustration and your moments of sweetness. But I'm just grateful to the Lord that we get to do that together. Uh, but we're going to continue on in our series. And I don't think it's an accident. We're in Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 to 19. 10 to 19. And let me frame it up this way for us. Uh, Time Magazine, Time Magazine picks one person to be the person of the year every year. And the most recent person was the president of Ukraine, Zelensky. Now this guy, right, and he looks pretty dapper right there. But he was the person of the year in 2022. Some other folks who've been are Obama, Mark Zuckerberg, Greta Thunberg, to name a few. But I wonder if you knew that this is how this actual person of the year for Time Magazine all started. So back in 1927, the Time Magazine editorial team, they came together, and they're sitting around, and they realized, oh, shoot, we messed up because uh, Chris, Charles Lindbergh, excuse me, the guy who flew the first aviation single flight from New York City to France, it was 3,600 miles, they forgot to put him on the cover that entire year. And so the team got together and said, why don't we just make something up, person of the year, and we'll get him on the, on the uh, magazine, and that will be kind of the stopgap for us. And that was 95 years ago. And that's the origin of the person of the year. So last week, if you were here with us, though, we were trying to define what success is. And the way that Time magazine would actually define su- success is the person who most successfully affects the news in our lives for good or ill and embodied what was important that year. That's the criteria of how you get on this page. But last week, we talked about, hey, what does it mean to be successful? And here's just a slide for you. Success, we said, is remaining gritty to the process that God has for you. Gritty meaning passionate and persevering to the process that God has for you. We also said grit is simply this. It's the passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. And today, what I want to do is, on our official, unofficial two-year birthday, is ask the church if God had a time magazine criteria for church. What church would be on the cover? And what would be the criteria to make the cover? If God had, one more time, a time magazine edition for church, which church would be on the front cover and what would be the criteria to get there? And again, I don't think it's an accident that we're having this conversation today on our second year. Kind of reflecting upon where has God been with us and where is he taking us? What does the future look like and what is God trying to build in us? So what does it mean? This is the question, right? Here's the next one. What does it mean to succeed as a faith community? If last week was, what does it mean to succeed as a person? What does it mean to succeed as a faith community? And what I want to do is, I just want to provide for us two goalposts. One that's internal, that's inside of us as a faith community. And one that's external and a part of our community. And then reveal what's in it for you. All right. If you were here, just show of hands. Were you here last week? Yeah? We're here two weeks ago. We're, have you been here two weeks in a row? All right, so I want to do a quick summary, but I promise you, I promise you, I'm not going to show you the same slide three weeks in a row, okay? I changed the background to green. Don't worry, okay? And I'm just kidding. Go to the next slide for me. But this is a summary of kind of where we've been and how we get to where we are today. First is that the Jews were exiled in 537 B.C. Then they got to go home via King Cyrus. Then they begin to rebuild in Haggai chapter 1 and chapter 2. And then Haggai chapter 2 verse 10 is where we meet. So they've started to rebuild, and it's actually been about four months since they've started to rebuild. And that's Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse 10. Take a look at verse 10. It reads, On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. So the 24th day of the ninth month is December 18th, 520 B.C. 
right? If you have your phone or if you have your Bible, you can go to uh, Haggai chapter 1, verse 15, and it reads the 24th day of the sixth month. And so if you put it all together, it's been, just like I said, four months. They've been building something now, the temple of God, for four months. Take a look at verse 11. It reads, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. So the priests are the guardians of the law. Just like Chris Pratt is the guardians of the galaxy. Is that right? I actually have no idea. I thought some of you would enjoy that though, right? They're the guardians of the law. They're making sure that the house of the law is in order. So in verse 11 it says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priest what the law says. Take a look at verse 12. If someone carries consecrated meat, and consecrated means holy or set apart. If they're carrying holy meat, I wonder if you knew that there's such a thing as holy meat. In the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew or some wine or olive oil or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, what did they say? He said, no. But here, go to the next slide. Here are some items of things that you could consecrate or make holy or set apart for a holy thing back in the Old Testament. You could consecrate a day. You can make a day holy. You can make a, spati- a spatial area holy. You can make a parts of a sacrifice holy. You can make ceremonial utensils like a fork holy. I don't know if they had forks back then. Then you can take a time of fasting and make it holy. All right. If we took that principle and applied it to 2023, that means that in theory, you could make this iPad holy. Now, if you're an Android user, you're like, no way, John. It doesn't work like that. But if you're an Apple user, you're like, amen, John. You could, this thing is definitely holy. But Haggai, chapter 2, is saying you can take an ordinary item and you can make it holy. You can consecrate it and you can set aside it for something holy. But then he goes a step further in verse 12 and says, if you put it under the garment, or if you cover it with a garment, does the garment also become holy? And what did the priest say? They said, yes, it does. But, and here's the question. Come on, track with me. And I know at this point you're saying, what does this have to do with anything, John? Did you have a long week this week? Like, what does this have to do with anything? You can make this holy. The second thing it touches it is holy. But if you take a look at Leviticus chapter 6, verse 27, it would tell you that the holy transfer only lasts to two, but not to three. Which is why they say no. Man, are you tracking with me? Holy? Second thing is holy, but the third thing is not holy. Answer, no. At this point, I hope you're thinking to yourself, what does this have to do with anything? Why is Haggai going on this seeming ramble about things that are holy, that touch holy, and then don't become holy? Well, let's see. Take a look at verse 13. Haggai is building a case. In essence, he's saying holy things make other things holy. Pure things make other things pure. Take a look at verse 13. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? He's saying, look, if something is defiled and it touches something else, does that thing become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Take a look up here at Numbers chapter 19, all right? And the Bible in some ways is so weird. It feels so odd. But again, I need you to build this case with me in the way that Haggai is building the case. In verse 11 it says, Whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean, not for six days, but for seven days. So what do they need to do? They must purify themselves with the water on the third day and also on the seventh day. Then they will be clean. But if they do not purify themselves on the third and seventh day, they will not be clean. Good thing you have Google Calendar today, right? Because what if you miss the third day and it's the fourth day? Well, it doesn't count. You're not clean anymore. Again, why is Haggai talking about this though? Track with me in his thoughts. Number one, he says... Pure things make things pure, right? Number two, impure things make other things impure, right? Now take a look at verse 14. This is where he's been going the entire time. And in verse 14 he says, Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and this nation, declares the Lord. Whatever they do, Whatever they offer is defiled. 
in essence, Haggai is saying, look, the right thing, building my temple, without the right heart, repentance, is the wrong thing. The right thing with the wrong heart is the wrong thing. He's saying whatever you're building, even if you keep building it, it doesn't matter because you haven't changed. Your heart hasn't changed. You haven't repented yet. So it's still defiled, the temple that you're building. Let's try it this way. So this week, um, I was on the phone with a pastor friend of mine uh, because he's going to do his first ever premarital counseling, right? So he's a bit nervous, so he called me and said, hey, John, um, have you ever done premarital counseling, sat down with a couple to talk about what to expect from marriage? And I was like, sure, but are you sure you want that advice from me? And he's like, I don't have anybody else. I was like, all right, let's have that conversation then. So we're having this conversation, and just imagine with me that you are the one giving counsel, right? So you're sitting in this room, and across the room is a husband and a wife, and the husband says, looking at the wife, I don't understand why you're still mad at me. I made your favorite dinner last night. I went out of my way, and I bought your favorite dessert, and I also went online and Googled, what do I get for a woman that has everything? And it told me to get this jar of candle that smells like sunshine, right? I did all these things for you. Like, I don't understand. Why are you still mad at me? And as the one giving counsel, you look at the wife, and the wife looks at her husband and says, what are you talking about, George? I asked you if you had seen my mother's wedding ring, and you lied to me. And you told me that you hadn't seen it, but instead you took it to the pawn shop, you got cash out of it, and you placed a bet on the Chicago Bears. And not only that, you never, number one, apologized, and number two, you never actually seem like you're going to change your ways. What would, you, what would you say if you're the one giving counsel? I think you'd say, number one, George, you're an idiot, right? That would be the number one thing you'd say, probably. For placing the bet on the bears, I'm saying. That's what I'm saying, right? Oh, of course, the ring, too. But number two, number two, I think you would say, Dinner, dessert, candles, those are all good things. And they're the right things to do for your wife, but without, watch this, without repentance. Without owning your mistake, making amends, turning from those decisions, and then not committing to repeating those things again to live rightly. We're not here questioning your effort, but your foundation on which you offer your efforts. You tracking with me? For the right thing without repentance is the wrong thing. Go back to Haggai. Haggai is saying the same exact thing. He's saying, look, you building the temple, it's the right thing. Getting the timber, collecting the workforce, sacrificing your time. But without repentance and a commitment to live rightly, this is wrong. It's defiled. It's impure. It's not acceptable to God. And so the first, the first internal marker, goalpost, that Haggai is raising for our faith community as we turn to is simply the question, are we like George? Are we like George? Meaning, we are coming and singing songs, which is a good thing. We are giving our finances, which is a good thing. We're reading our Bibles and engaged in spiritual practices, which are good things, yet are our hearts in the right place. Have we owned our mistakes as a community? Have we made amends collectively and said, God, you are priority? Uh, now, if you're tracking with me, you might say, John, I, I get the repentance part. That doesn't matter how flashy and consistent our worship is unless we own our mistakes to God and make amends and turn from those decisions, God won't receive our worship and sacrifice. Hey, that was a real heart check for me this week as I read it again. But what does, what does right living look like as a faith community? What's the external goalpost of living with God in a way that's honoring to him? All right, so I've mentioned before that there aren't 1 or 10 or 15, but there are 613 laws that God gave to Israel for internal and external laws that they need to keep for them to be pure. All right? 
So buckle up. We're going to do 613 right now. Are you ready? No, I'm kidding. Okay? I know there's cake. Don't worry. We're not going to do all 613. But ha have you guys ever seen this before? You know what, these, you know what this is? Yeah? You know? How many of you guys have used this before? Spark Notes? Spark Notes? I got you. You're caught. I got you. No. Spark Notes was uh, one of my favorite friends. Okay? It was one of my really good buddies next to chocolate milk in junior high and in high school. I actually had this class my senior year. Uh, this is recorded. All right, in the senior year, right, where you would read books, and then you would have to read the books and then sit with your teacher to explain to the teacher what the book content was about, and then you'd get points, and if you amass like 30 points, you'd get an A. I don't think I read a book that year. <laughs> I just read spark note after spark note. And I think at one point he knew what I was doing, but he was just very gracious. But uh, spark notes was actually born in 1999, with, by four dudes at Harvard. So these four guys at Harvard came together and they invented something called Spark Notes. But what I want you to realize, as you think about these 613 laws, is that these four dudes are not the inventor of Spark Notes or the principal of Spark Notes or get it most right, but Jesus is. Because you know what he did? He took 613 laws and he made it into two principles. Two sentences. And said, look, you want to live rightly, you just got to do two things. One, it's internal. One is external. Here it is, Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 37. Jesus replied, first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's repentance, right? It's putting God first. The compass is first. God is first. It's not artificial worship, but it's your heart turning to him. And he says the second, the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Take a look at verse 40. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, meaning living rightly. Hey, Jesus says out of the 613 laws, you can make them all into two. One of them vertical, one of them horizontal. One of them vertical and one of them horizontal. But what does it actually mean, though, to love your neighbor as yourself? I think that's the key that we need to unlock. I think the first part, the horizontal, the repentance, coming back to him, honoring him, intuitively, it makes a lot more sense. But what does loving our neighbor really look like? What does that mean? Here are just a few verses for you to consider. In Leviticus chapter 19, it says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. So loving your neighbor is not seeking revenge or bearing a grudge against anyone. Here's another one. Again from Leviticus chapter 19. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you are foreigners in Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. It's loving the foreigner. Here's just one more from Jeremiah chapter 29. This is actually a part of our mission statement. And I think this actually gives us a holistic picture of what it looks like. And I think where God is trying to take us. In Jeremiah chapter 29, starting in verse 4, it says this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Watch this. It says, build houses and settle down. That's having ownership. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. That's economic engagement. Marry and have sons and daughters. That's relational engagement. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. That's generational longevity. Verse 7. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. It's mutual peace-seeking. In other words, catch it. The external goal for a successful faith community is not just come and gather on Sunday to sing and listen, which are good things, but go and seek the flourishing of your community. It's both. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy named Jason, Jason Jans. He's in Denver, Colorado. And in 2008, he started this church called Providence Bible Church. Providence Bible Church. And I think they were actually very similar to kind of our faith community, our church community. 
Uh, they were trying to figure out, hey, what is God calling us to do? Who is he calling us to be? And so once in a while, once in a while they would host different events. They would have a backpack drive or they would give away turkeys around Thanksgiving or they would try to uh, give away food to those who are in need. Again, these are all really, really good things, all good things. But as they were kind of trekking through that journey, uh, he says that he came to a point where he asked himself this question. Is God really calling us to events, which are good, singular events? Or is God, as it says in Jeremiah 29, calling us to abolish relational, economic, and spiritual poverty through career and community development? Is it more singular or is it more holistic? This is the question that these guys were asking. And so in 2014, listen to this. In 2014, they put together a strategic plan, and since then, they have helped over 400 families become self-sufficient and have helped more than 1,000 people be lifted out of generational poverty. Not just singular events or giving people an immediate need, but helping 1,000 men, women, and kids come out of generational poverty. Because they believe in saying, hey, we're here and we want to support any way we can. I think sometimes uh, we think churches only love God. But I think as we've seen in Matthew 22 and Jeremiah 29, it's love God and, and love your neighbor. It's both. And so here's just a real quick list. Just, and this, this comes from these guys who are out there in Denver. Uh, just six common practices in living rightly. And I wonder if some of these will surprise you. And I think I'll get a few amens on some of them as well. But take a look at the first one. Put to rest the erroneous belief that effectiveness is measured by how many people attend the church on Sunday morning. I want you to think about this with me for a minute. What church would be on the cover of God's Time magazine? Is it the church that has 3,000 people every weekend in attendance? Or is it the church that has maybe 300 people who are effectively being mobilized to help people on a socioeconomic, financial, and spiritual level, lifting them out of generational poverty? The erroneous belief that effectiveness is measured by how many people attend the church on Sunday morning. Number two, focus more on having mega influence than on becoming a mega church. Number three, this one was for me, pastor the neighborhood, not simply the church. But I think that applies to us too. What does it look like for us to love the neighborhood, not simply the church? Four, recognize Sunday sermons are necessary but not sufficient. Can I get an Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, Sunday sermons are necessary, but they're not sufficient for transformation. It's not. So what does that look like for us in the future? Number five, reclaim the values of longevity in terms of place and relationship. And number six, invest significant time, effort, and money into leadership development. So let me say this. What is the external goalpost of right living that God requires for us in 2023 uh, as a faith community, here's the first one, is that God's measure of success. And this is what I really do believe. I think this is where God has taken us as well, where he has us right now. God's measure of success is loving God and loving my neighbor, not bigger buildings, bigger budgets, and more butts and seats. You know, I think... A Sunday gathering, it's helpful and it's healthy, but that cannot be our only metric. When I think about, you know, if God really did have a church where there was a Time Magazine Church of the Year, who would be on there? I have no idea. But I'm pretty certain that it wouldn't simply be a measure of how big it is. It would be measured by how engaged they are, how much radical love and sacrifice they have how much they're giving to help people and support people that are in real need. So what does that mean for us? Here's the next one. And this is really our mission statement, right? That once excited exists to help people pursue, 
Jesus, participate in the flourishing of our community, and proclaim Jesus, proclaim Jesus to all people. Uh, now you might be asking, well, well, John, what does that mean? Does that mean that 168 is a social justice movement? And what I would simply say is what Mark DeMaz would say, is that Jesus without justice is insufficient. Yet justice without Jesus is also insufficient. It has to be a both and. Hey, can I just see your eyes here real quick? Hey, this is my encouragement, honestly. All right? Is that the people that God wants to utilize in the second year of this church to say it's not about bigger buildings, it's not about a bigger budget, it's not about more butts and seats, but it's about helping people pursue Christ and participate in the flourishing of our communities and proclaim Jesus to all people, you're here. And God will send those he needs to send here. Your heart for the marginalized, your heart for those who are in need, your heart for those who need to be heard, God honors that. And he wants us to dream, big dreams to figure out how do we use those things for his purposes? And he can do it. He took 12 and he changed the world. 12 friends and he changed the world. God's measure of success is loving God, is loving God and loving my neighbor, not bigger buildings, bigger budgets, and more butts in seats. Hey, we're going to close it out, but take a look at verse 16, verse 16 to 19. And let's take a look at what happens when a faith community pursues God that way. Take a look at verse 16 and 19. It reads, when anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there was only 10. So meaning when they didn't repent, when they didn't seek God in this way, they lost 50% of revenue. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. They lost 60%. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, with mildew and hail, Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord, but from this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there any seed any left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. But look at this promise that God gives to the people of God who are going to seek him like this. From this day on. I will bless you. And you know what the word bless means? It means to be filled with strength. Hey, do you need to be filled with strength? Do you need your feet and your hands to be filled with strength? To have the grit that you need to continue to persevere, to fulfill the passion that God has laid on your heart? He says, man, if you would... Do the right thing with the right heart, then that's the right thing. If you would love God and love people, then I will give you the strength that you need for whatever you need. I'm going to invite uh, the team to come back forward as we just close out today, as we think about kind of where God is taking us, what he's trying to do in and through us. But uh, if you were here the first week, I shared this little device with you, right? The sermon series title for us is that easy is not better. And this is from Staples in the 90s where you could press it, right? That was easy. And it would say that was easy and you'd get new staples or new paper, whatever you need. And as a visual reminder for you and for me as a church, let's not choose what's easy. The easy thing would be to say, hey, how do we figure out How do we grow this thing simply in number and in mass? How do we get a bigger budget, a nicer building, have a nicer Sunday service? I think, again, those are not bad things. But the harder thing is to say, how is God calling us to reach those who are in most need? What does it look like to be a church that really loves its neighbor? The one that the world says is the least lovable. How do we become a people? When they think about 168 Church, they don't say, oh yeah, that small church over there. They might be small, but man, do they love God. 
man, do they show up. Man, do I know that when we need something, they'll be there. And not just when it's convenient, but sacrificially we'll give of our finances, of our time, of our talents, because it's not about us, but it's about showing the Lord Jesus that they're loved by Him, that you are loved by Him. Would you do this? Would you rise if you're able? Would you just take a minute before we sing this last song, just as a, we're going to sing it as a prayer that Christ would be magnified. And I know it says, oh, Christ be magnified in me. But man, my prayer is that Christ would be magnified in us. However long God has us, that he would be magnified in the way that we do Sundays, in the ways that we do Mondays and Tuesdays, in our personal lives, in our jobs, in our relationships, that Christ would be magnified in us. That he would be magnified and glorified in us. If that's your prayer, if that's your desire, would you just take a, a minute right now, just bow your heads and close your eyes, and just between you and God, I'm going to do this too. Just pray. Would you pray for not only yourself and for your family or your relationships, but would you pray for this church? Just pray that God would be magnified in you. The way that we love him in our heart posture, the way that we love others, that he would be magnified. just reminded of uh, Matthew chapter 18 where you say where two or more are gathered in your name there you are with them and God we recognize that that verse is talking about discipline that when somebody who is out of their way going into a lifestyle that is not good for them or for you that when two or more are gathered together that you're with them in that conflict but God what a beautiful picture that in the hardest of a challenge when you're trying to reorient a life that is living in a way that is hazardous to them, that you promise your presence. But God, we know that if you promise your presence there in that situation, that you promise your presence when we're gathered together as people trying to seek your face, to love you, to make sure that our heart's internal motivation is right, where we're trying to love our neighbor. God, to love the foreigner amongst us, to love the marginalized amongst us, to love the needy person amongst us. God, when, when people see one six eight, they would say, they really love God, but man, do they really love people. God, may they be true of us. May that truth and principle be solidified as we close with this song today. God, thank you for loving us, that we may love others. Thank you for being good to us so that we may be good to others. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this out to the Lord.